Welcome to Decoding the Conflict Mindset. I'm Dr. Deborah Dupree, your host and founder of Decoding the Conflict Mindset podcast. My goal is to help influence minds worldwide about how to think about conflict differently. Many of us will run and avoid conflict at all costs, but when we stop and reflect about the opportunities that conflict have, we can reframe it and look at conflict as an opportunity, not an adversity. As even Albert Einstein said, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. So I'm delighted to bring to you our guest speaker today, Annette Taylor. And Annette has been working for over the last six years on studying evolutionary psychology as a hobby. Strangely, she actually enjoys doing this kind of research and earned a master's degree in educational psychology some 25 years ago, so her current studies build upon that. After she started her own family and had a couple of kids, she became concerned about the world that her children were growing up in and what it was going to be like to navigate a world that was increasingly becoming less civil than the world she grew up in. This is what triggered her to dive deeper into what makes human beings tick. Now, for those of you who follow me, you know that I love to bring into the neuroscience of our human brain and therefore our behavior, emotions and cognitions. And oftentimes we'll relate it back to the fact that neurobiologically, we're pretty much the same as our evolutionary predecessors. Annette takes another direction in terms of looking at our ancestral history. And her perspective is rather unique from what I know, since she now views the world using an ancestral biological cave dwelling lens. One of the important differences in people she's noticed is how much control we modern humans have in our daily lives in a growing inability when we lose control in how we act civilly. So I can't wait to have you hear more from our guest speaker, Annette Taylor, and let's welcome her. We'll be starting in just a few moments. If there's still time, invite your friends, colleagues, and others to subscribe or listen in. Share the link. We'd be happy to have you. Welcome to Decoding the Conflict Mindset. I'm Dr. Deborah Dupree, your host and founder of the DCM Podcast. I'm so delighted to have you join us today with our guest speaker, Annette Taylor. Welcome, Annette. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. You know, I was introduced to Annette by another um, podcast host, and uh, I believe it was Matthew Carroll. It was no? Sam. Sam Artery. Sam. There we go. Yeah. yeah, Sam was just before Matt. There, I got yeah. him. There we go. But uh, they're both from Indiana, so I connected the two of them. Believe Fun. it or not. Yeah, yeah. And um, I've since had conversations with both. Um, but one of the things that um, Sam said to me, because we were talking about perceptions and, you know, approaches to conflict and the mindset. And he said, you got to meet Annette. And, and, uh, and so as we've connected, and I'm really curious, Annette, there's a few things that come out to me. And first of all, you your alter ego in your blog series, Cave Girl Claire. And so I want to hear more about that. But I also want to hear you know, what got you into this perspective of looking at the ancestral viewpoint of human beings? Oh, yes. Great question. So uh, Cave Girl Claire is what I call the part of me that I consider kind of my ancestral self. And I got to know her. It took a little while, but over the last six years, I've kind of took this perspective of looking at life as if I were a cave dweller, just to simplify things for me, because I think as modern people, sometimes we're overwhelmed with the amount of information that we're expected to pay attention to and process. And so um, I went through a time where I was obsessed with a TV show, and I kind of wanted to know how that happened in my mind, because it didn't happen when I was 13. It happened when I was 47. And the big difference is that I had the internet. So I was able to get obsessed with the show. And I got very interested in how that could have happened. Mm. And so um, I started to simplify life 
through this ancestral view. I started doing research in evolutionary psychology. I started following a few researchers and they gave me kind of one-on-one, -on -one, not advice, but like feedback on the things that I was wondering about and, and studying about and came up with this kind of persona of um, when I feel myself being like instinctual or, or reacting to something, I call it my cave dweller. Mm -hmm. And it helps me kind of process my own behavior, essentially. That's really interesting because um, I know that you and I've talked too as, as uh, you know, my um, adventure back into postgraduate education and getting my doctorate is what, you know, it was so different than when I got my graduate degree. But the Oh, gosh, the window of opportunity by looking at uh, human behavior and understanding human psychology from a, um, a neurobiological perspective in terms of what we now know and understand about the brain that we didn't 30, 40 more years. And um, and so how so much of how we function today has neurobiological foundations, as well as our early up. Um, early childhood upbringing but now you're taking it even to another level you know in terms of um you know how this is sort of a condition of human kind right human mm -hmm. beings mm -hmm. yeah so you know you one of the the focal points of our topic today was you know of course the conflict mindset but also uh the notion of civility in today's mm -hmm. world that Unfortunately, it seems so lacking in many regards. And so elaborate a little bit about why is it so difficult and challenging to be civil in today's world of rapid fire, immediate um, availability to things happening all over? Yeah, it's kind of a like not stark per perspective change, but it is kind of like for me, it simplifies things. If I imagine what's happening around me, if I take a cave dweller perspective, sometimes it will like, oh, that's what's really happening. So I think it's harder for modern people or people with a, as much information as we have at our fingertips these days to be civil because I think we get kicked into fear um, in a different way. Like when we were living as an um, nomadic ancestral group, the thing that scared us was pretty obvious. Like it would be a saber tooth tiger or it would be a person that wasn't in our tribe. It was quite clear what we should be scared of and what we shouldn't. And I think that we're kind of triggered um, by different things. And those things are now not always, you know, existential threats or um, threats to our, our physical well-being. But sometimes I think when we meet a person that might have a different point of view, that can be triggering mm -hmm. um even though it's not a physical threat it might be a psychological threat does that make sense yes absolutely because uh, what as you were talking i'm thinking oh yeah you know it's uh, you know we start to fear when things are you know we're confronted with things that are unknown or unexpected or maybe different from our way of thinking right now and so it's it creates uh, i would i would say what's happening well, not to undermine the physical safety because we know there's so much of physical safety that's um, at risk, but um, our sense of psychological safety, our sense of security, our sense of well-being, our sense of familiarity, you know, in, in what we're, we're accustomed to being. And so, yeah, very much our, you know, our psychological being, our psychological safety is huge in mm -hmm. triggering how we show up. Yeah, and we have so much control over our day-to-day -day. That simple things like a change in routine can put us in this state of fear. And we not, are not always aware of when we're scared. So that's just something that I've noticed in like human behavior in general. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very valid. You know, you made a, a comment in, you know, in getting to know you for today's um, uh, interview. We share the same biology. And once we truly accept that, we will be able to communicate better. Say more about that. Basically, I think we're kind of hard, not only on each other, but on ourselves. And if we all got to the point, or if more of us got to the point where we accepted how easily we got kicked into fear, I think we would be a lot more patient with each other. Because if you knew, if I had a belief and you threatened my belief that I would react and fight, fight, or freeze, flight, 
fight, flight, or freeze, you might accept, not accept, but understand a rash reaction more quickly. Mm -hmm. If you knew that I had this belief and you threatened my belief and you can be like, okay, this person's now upset and is actually scared. How can I connect with this person in another way so they feel less threatened? Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah, you know, and what I'm, I'd like to add to that because sometimes we may trigger other people by you know what we say and what we do, et cetera, um, without intention. And, you know, so, I mean, I know what your belief is, but, but I would take it back to, um, I do a lot of work around emotional intelligence and say, okay, whoa, I realize I just triggered you in some way, Annette. I'm not sure how or why, so help me understand. Let's have a conversation about that rather than, you know, because what I see is that people, you know, like, like you said, you get triggered by what somebody has said intentionally or unintentionally, and then I react to your reaction. You know, yeah. and so then we get into the circle of yeah. uh, this dance of conflict because now it's, yeah. you know, yeah. instead of what, wait a minute. Okay. I just triggered you and I don't even know what I did or said, but right. obviously I did. So that's your emotional intelligence and being aware of what you've done to, you know, to provoke a response in somebody else. Right. And so, you know, where, where uh, is this all instinctual? Is this uh, out of blindness, ignorance? Um, what is it about new things that can be so scary? Um, I think it's a, it's a lack of experience usually because um, in modern life, if we have access to the internet or phones, um, we, we know how our days should go. Mm -hmm. We know where the people we love are mm -hmm. almost every minute of the day. If we have, you know, tracking things on our phones um, and when unexpected, Expected things happen, we get kicked into fear quicker mm -hmm. than if we didn't know what was going to happen throughout our day. And mm -hmm. when we didn't have foes and we didn't have the internet, even 30 years ago, people weren't carrying phones around. They didn't know, they didn't always know what was going to happen next. And we were okay. We survived. We even survived, you know, without knowing who was going to be alive in our tribe by the end of the day. Like we have this psychological strength to cope, it, it's almost like surprises, no matter what, are bad now, because we we, we think we know what's going to happen next. And we think we're in control. Yes, that's <laughs> huge. <laughs> and yeah. we are to an extent, but I, I, I hope that you know, someday we get to the point where people are okay with not being so in control, because we, we, we can do that. We, we used to do it when we lived in ancestral groups. I know we can do it again, so I'm just like, I'm rooting for us. I'm really rooting for her. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you, you you raised to my attention as we're talking, um, um, you know, Stephen Covey's work, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Mm -hmm. And I draw a lot on his work because now we have the neuroscience that actually proves, you know, some of the things that he, he learned through his research anecdotally back in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, um, he, he does a lot with four quadrants. And I love it because it's like, okay, very, very, Okay, concrete, let's work with it. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the, the things um, he said that highly effective people know exactly what they control and what they don't. Mm -hmm. And I, I would suggest that um, I would, I, I modified it for my own work to say, okay, control, but I would prefer manage because we can't control, you know, world events, life events that happen via, we have nothing to do with, but they happen. And, and so it's, it's, we can't control that. And even our instinctual reaction to the fight, flight, you know, fear or freeze response is also the same. Um, we can't control what's going to happen. It's how we manage it. Mm -hmm. That's important. So mm -hmm. recognize what I can control and what I can't. But more importantly, how do I manage myself? Mm -hmm. Because then how I manage myself will influence and impact those around me. Absolutely. And um, and that's where we can make a difference. And so, but that fear of loss of control is definitely greater for some than it is for others. Right. And um, and and so then that's a whole other element or level to look at right. in this control issue. Because when you go back to ancestral times, I imagine you know it's true there that you know they certainly didn't know what they could control or not, but it was really more of how they responded, how they right. uh, managed themselves. Do I fight? Do I flee? You know, or what are the dangers if I just freeze here and hide, you know? Right. And it's a lot of it. It's about conserving personal energy, too. Yeah. OK. OK. So when we're scared and maybe we've touched on this already, 
Um, why is it that we act so inappropriately? Um, because it, we're perceiving a threat, essentially. Even if it's not technically a threat, suddenly it feels like a threat. And so if you can kind of get to the point where you recognize in other people the fight, flight, or freeze, it's harder to see it in yourself, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it's easier to see it in someone else. And, and when you see that fight, flight, or freeze, you can either sidestep them mm -hmm. because you don't, you can't connect with them because they're not themselves, or you can reach out to them and try to connect with them at some level. It, it's interesting to think about threats existing in modern life because we try to minimize threats at every, <laughs> every turn and we are, we are ready for threats like that that's how we survived in our ancestral group and so the things that trigger us now are very different yeah yeah and uh you know i would say our world of late has become even more complex and um difficult to expect on what we can control and manage um so what are your suggestions um in terms of how we get better um at doing you know at you know that, that those natural instincts of fight flight or free you know freeze mm -hmm. How can we do that better, more gracefully? What suggestions do you have based on your research about what you and me and every listener out there can do? Um, it's mostly about awareness. Mm -hmm. And you can start with self-awareness, recognizing that you are going and accepting that you're going to be have moments where you're not in control of yourself and explaining to the people around you when you realize, oh, wow, sorry about that. Um, I wasn't myself just then. Can can I can I try that again? Or I need to take a breath um, and do it again. Because when we're talking about control, I don't think people can be in total control of themselves, and certainly not of other people. So um, any opportunity to kind of observe observe yourself and accept responsibility for when you're out of control and accept it except when other people lose control once in a while you know certainly not accept any physical attack or anything like that i'm not saying that but um just be aware that they are unconsciously kicked into fear oh well, yeah yeah i you said a lot right there and so um i know i'll, I'll use the term you know own own it you know what's your reaction yeah. that's yours okay nobody can take that away from you right. um but again, it's like, how does that show up? And now how does that influence others? Because you're absolutely right. You know, as, as um, Cubby and many others will say, I can't control you, but I can influence you by how I conduct myself. Mm -hmm. I can either influence you adversely or positively, depending upon how I show up and behave. And so it is really starting with that self-awareness. that's so key, yeah. fundamental to our emotional intelligence. Yeah. yeah. And then and how I we manage we, ourselves. Yes. And I think that we we kind of assume within ourselves that we are in control. And I, I think that's an, an unfortunate assumption that many people make. For for sure. <laughs> because, <laughs> um, you know, if we take a look, and I just heard this the other day, um, you know, I mean, the mind and body connection are alive and well and more so than we ever knew it before. In fact, even Kaiser Permanente has a, uh, a little advertisement about, you know, their treatment specialists and so forth. But what if one thing is connected to another thing and then that thing contributes to something else? And so that's why it's a team approach and taking a look at the both the mind and the body in terms of what's influencing what. And um, uh, yeah, I, I would say as a human race, we have a long way to go in understanding some of those basic fundamentals because we all think, oh, this is the way I am. Well, yeah and no because you can learn to be other right. other more positive things yeah and real quick the 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 opposite of fight flight and freeze is rest digest re renew rest, oh i rest, like that digest repair okay so rest digest repair and repair yeah okay. so like sleep sleep will do those things for you and yeah. and natural sleep <laughs> Oh, thank you for uh, acknowledging that. Because we can have alcohol induced, we can have drug induced, yeah. <laughs> we can have exhaustion induced, but that's right. all. Not stuff. the same for your synapses at all. <laughs> yeah, 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 that is so important because one of the things I I do when I'm working with people at any level at in any setting is that well, let me just ask you a few fundamentals. How's your How's your sleep? How's your eating? How's your exercise? Because all of those are key to you know how we function. 
And we're seeing more and more, particularly about you know the benefits of walking, for example, or running if you can still do that. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, sleep is fundamental um, because I know from my research, um, when you lack sufficient sleep, it's like being a little bit intoxicated all the time uh, because we're not quite there. It's like having a uh, you know a drink or two. Uh, under our belts, shall we say, and mm -hmm. uh, we're slightly impaired in terms of our cognitive right. emotional reactions. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 And so um, do you have a, you know, some specific tips that you can share with our, our, our viewers and listeners about, you know, how, how can we take steps gracefully to show up with civility and managing our fears? Yeah. So getting enough um, sleep, um, eating healthy food. I once saw a um, chocolate covered granola bar that said paleo diet on it one time. And I was like, no. <laughs> um, I don't know that existed in that form, but okay. Yeah, no. I, I, like, I like the idea of paleo diet, but um, you really have to take it from an ancestral view. Like what percentage of what we ate was foliage? <laughs> And what percentage was meat? And it, it was hardly any meat. And certain diets are very heavy in meat. And another funny thing I think is how people assume that hydration will save us all. And we didn't drink all that much water when we lived in nomadic ancestor groups. And we survived. Granted, we only lived till we were 40 or 50. Yeah, maybe carrying plastic bottles of water around not always necessary you know you know just kind of take a breath and take it from a, a view of a, a cave dweller sometimes can clarify you know what choices you should make day to day you know simplify and um, if it's convenient chances are it's bad for the environment so that's mm. my little okay. piece of <laughs> I like that because particularly in today's world plastic um uh, you know I know you know, at one point, um, I always, you know, provided plastic bottles of water for my clients coming to my office, for example, mm -hmm. or I always had bottles of water I could take with me as I drove to appointments or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, so I always you have water on hand, but I also, you know, um, attempted to recycle those bottles. But my kids, uh, who were in their late twenties, you know, are the ones that you know convinced me, like, no, you know, stop the plastic bottles. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I got for a long time now. Um, yeah, and you might not need the the hydration really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, yeah. like if you're thirsty, absolutely drink something. But yeah. it's yeah. just a, a different way to look at life. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is, and uh, and recognizing the signs of of um, hydration or dehydration and and what you need to do about that. Yeah, and so I'm curious. Uh, you again, your website is called the um, uh, CaveDwellerClub.com. What can people expect by going there? Um, so uh, over the last six years, I've been doing a lot of research. And so what you would find is if you went a little deeper, you would see a list of references, all the things I've read to figure out what I write about. Um, you would find my blog that I wrote over two and a half years. Um, and I wrote it as I discovered these things by doing research. So if you read it top to bottom, you will you will gradually be introduced to um, the ancestral view, essentially. And I think it's important to introduce things to people, to humans, gradually, because in nature, things happen gradually. I don't want to overwhelm anyone. So if you decide to read my blog, I would say read one or two a day and then sleep on it because it is a little bit of, a, of an adjustment if you yeah. um, really take it all in. And I have a place to ask my cave dweller questions called ask Claire. Mm -hmm. um, I have um, all my other podcast interviews are there. I have examples of answers that I've given to people when they ask cave girl Claire a question. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a series of um, playlists that link to each blog post, which are kind of fun that I hear like biological ancestral messages in modern songs and so I've collected them and and attached them to certain parts of Cave Girl Claire's story. So there's a mm -hmm. lot. There's a lot of fun stuff. 
<laughs> well, very good. Um, thank you so much for articulating that because I certainly have visited your website and I'm going, okay, uh, what, you know, what can I pull out of this? But as I found um, is that, you know, as our, our featured speakers, you know your topic best and you know what you want to emphasize um, and to guide people in their journey and search. And what I really love about your message, Annette, is that you know, take it back to basics, take it back to simplicity, you know, and, um, you know, sometimes we make the world too complex and complicated. And um, if we just go back to some basics, like I do with the neuroscience of our behavior, you take it even further back in terms of our ancestral history, that we can learn a lot if we go back in time and just look at basic human behavior. Yep. Yeah, great, great. Well, Annette, I am so delighted to have you on here as far as, again, understanding the conflict mindset, you know, the whole role of civility, which is challenging uh, in in today's modern world. And, um, and if we take it back to the basics, to our ancestral origins, that we can learn a lot. It's true. <laughs> yep, yes, yes. So listeners and viewers, you're Heard it here, not first, I'm afraid to say, because she's been on many other podcasts, but at least on Decoding the Conflict Mindset, another layer to understanding how we show up in conflict and uh, what we can do about it. And so she's given some great tips as far as uh, gracefully managing some of those reactive fear-based instincts. And I uh, encourage you to visit her website and her blog, again, uh, cavedwellerclub.com. We have with us Clave, Clave Dweller Claire, no, Cave Girl. Oh, Cave Girl Claire. Yep. There we go. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you again. And uh, the viewers and listeners come back and join us anytime you want. Pass this along because I think this is a really fresh and insightful viewpoint of human dynamics and human behavior in the modern world. So let's learn from it and let's grow with it. So thank you for joining us. Dr. Deborah Dupree, the Mindset Doc, Decoding the Conflict Mindset Podcast. Well, I certainly hope that you enjoyed a different take on the evolution of humankind from the insights and experiences of Annette Taylor. Always incredible to learn, grow, and develop. Well, we're going to take a slight shift. In our next episode of Decoding the Conflict Mindset, we're going to take an opportunity to share with you the top most watched episodes from Season 3, 2023. And it won't surprise you, perhaps, that the most popular watched episode was about conflict in our schools with Sean Gatlin. So come back and listen and learn. And then also, How to Rise Above Narcissistic Abuse with Ina Johnson Myers. And then from litigation to mediation and a transformation of mindset and strategy. And How do we move forward in calming an angry person in just 90 seconds? And then where is the future of our post-pandemic virtual world? So come back, listen and learn in just a couple of weeks, mark your calendar, and we look forward to having you back to learn more about the top five most watched episodes in 2023, season three. I'm Dr. Deborah Dupree. The Mindset Doc, we transform confrontations into conversations.